lunchtime almost, but um, you know, this, this, the title of this uh, section, Innovation and the Future, obviously I don't think there is a future without innovation. So we've seen a whole range of, of topics uh, related to uh, what's happening, what's in the mindset of, of uh, the speakers and what's uh, potential for the future. So why don't we open it up for questions and feel free to ask um, any of the presenters a question. Um, not sure if we have a microphone circulating or not. But uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, yes, you with with your uh, in the yeah middle section there. Yeah, there's a sorry, there's a microphone right in the middle there. You got it, uh, Benedict. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, I'm Jason Pomeroy from Broadway Malian. I'd like to figure out whether the public uh, courts, those sort of sky courts, are actually really really public, uh, or are they uh, sort of semi-public spaces? Um, that's a great question uh, uh, because we've asked ourselves about, you know, you're replicating the sense of a neighborhood from a city. And so the true sort of public space is the observation level at the top of the tower. And then those, those sky gardens are really kind of semi-public spaces. Well, it would be important that there's security in place considering the nature of the tower. So it's not public space like you might describe Central Park in New York City, but it's publicly accessible. Uh, hi, yes, yeah, so another uh, uh, question uh, regarding the, the Shanghai Tower project. Um, in terms of the uh, energy modeling, uh, when you looked at the double skin approach, you know, the, the tallest double skin facade in the world, uh, had, had the design team looked at the embodied energy content and made an, an assessment of embodied energy versus the operational energy, I understand there is some, you know, the, uh, some debate when it comes to the double skin facade about uh, you know, its, its carbon content overall over the lifetime of the building and so forth. I wonder if you could comment on that. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, that's something that, you know, um, I'm working on other projects that also have double facades, and that's something that we're always asking ourselves, especially when you're floating low iron glass, which has an even higher carbon content than clear glass, for example. Um, but in the case of Shanghai Tower, and I think this is a great question about the question of really tall buildings, are they inherently sustainable or not? Um, this is a building that has a specified lifespan of 100 years. So a bonded performance of 100 years, right? So, but in reality, we know this is an artifact that will maybe be around 500 years or even longer, right? So I think when you look at that embodied energy, and we saw some great sort of cost analysis earlier, the presentation about that as well, you see there's this sort of life cycle payback and then there's other longer term paybacks. And in this case, we were convinced because the double skin is not just an energy saving move, it's also really creating the form of the tower that makes it responsive at an urban scale and it allows the ability to have those community amenity levels that are elevated above. And so that sense of neighborhood that, so it's sustainability is sustaining that historic experience of the city is allowed because you've created that amenity level. Okay, Bill, go ahead. Question for Paul and Travis from Getch Partners. Uh, obviously, your project is unique because you, you went vertically uh, from an existing building. I'm just wondering how early in the process, and I don't know if it was the same contractor from phase one to phase two, how early in the process did you bring uh, a construction team in for planning purposes? It, it was definitely the same contractor for both phases one and two. And uh, obviously it was vital that they were uh, part of that process from the beginning because once you decide to go vertical, the whole logistics of how you go about doing that, whether it's from the uh, constructability of doing something like that or, or the staging of the materials as well as the access to the site, making sure that the, the people that work in the building are safe and protected, all of that has to be considered. So. All of that has to come in, uh, maybe not right at the conceptual phase of it, but very close to that. 
at the yeah at the schematic phase rough, uh, roughly. Any other questions? Okay, I have one question I want to ask Philip, and uh, just one note. Uh, before asking is if you haven't seen, uh, out near the registration, we've uh, conducted a student competition which the uh, uh, short list of projects have been posted. And actually, I think it's a great uh, exhibition, some incredible work, really uh, diligent work has been done. But it actually asks us to stretch our minds a bit and not to think of things the same way we did maybe today as we would tomorrow. And so I, I appreciated your presentation, Philip, on um, you know, taking something as simple as the passive house and, and trying to apply that. I thought you did an incredible uh, build up to the fact that there is an inherent uh, benefit, uh, yet a challenge in, in high rise. And I was waiting for you to present the solution. How are we going to get to that passive house, um, even though the, you know, excessive uh, overheating days were certainly there? Um, do you have a plan for that and, and, and or do you have a solution for that? Because I think there's, there's a lot in that that's relevant for the future of tall buildings and, and the performance that, that uh, they demand. Thanks, Tim. Um, I don't really have a solution. I mean, what was presented there was very much initial research, three months of working with students who came to Nottingham and had very little um, concept of A, what a tall building was in the first place. Um, personally, there's elements of Passive House which I do feel uh, uh, show potential for tall buildings, the idea of compactness, the idea of holding in heat, but at the same time there's certain elements of Passive House which sit, um, don't sit so well with me, the idea that natural ventilation is not promoted and there's so much is reliant on mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. Uh, one of the things we are looking at doing is we are working with a Passive House Institute in the UK to try and turn this very small piece of research into something much bigger. I'm hoping one of my students will do a PhD on it. Um, this might be a bit of a funding issue there, so if anyone in here wants to fund that, um, come and talk to me, please. Um, but um, I, I agree, and I think my, the driving force behind what I presented really isn't saying if Passive House was right or wrong, it was saying that, look, there's some inherent sustainable advantages of being tall, and not just density, but in the form, in the initial form and compactness of the building in the very much in the, in the first place. So um, maybe in Shanghai I might have a, an answer to you. Well, I would encourage it, because I, I do think for the audience at large, when it, when it comes to innovation and the future of high-rises, the kind of science that you've put into understanding how we can make uh, use of the uniqueness of these buildings, and yet there are going to be challenges, but there hopefully are solutions to those challenges so that we have higher performing buildings that are high rise. And so I would encourage uh, you to keep striving for that. I think that's, uh, I was waiting for it, and I'm a little, uh, I'm sort of at the cliffhanger. So, um, if, are there any more questions? Everybody's hungry, so I'll let you close. Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming to this wonderful session, and uh, let's thank again for those wonderful speakers for their in innovative presentation.